Good afternoon, everyone. This is Sam Drew with the National Dropout Prevention Center, and I'm here with my co-host and colleague, Marty Duckenfield, also with the center. Welcome all of you to this monthly radio webcast brought to you by the National Dropout Prevention Center at Clemson University in partnership with Clemson Radio Productions and the generous support of Penn Foster. It's so nice to be here on a bright, sunny day here in Clemson. We're delighted to have all of you with us for this live broadcast focusing on solutions to the dropout crisis. We welcome back those of you who have joined us in the past and particularly want to welcome our new listeners to the program. Now, I mentioned the weather because last month our program was caught between two tornadoes here in Clemson, and so we experienced uh, some technical difficulties, and the program was on educational technology. Would you believe it? <laughs> However, it was recorded, and the reason I mention this is if you missed it or you were unable to get the sound, you can now access the program from the archives on our website. At this point... I would like to remind our listeners of the materials that we provide on the website for today's program. First of all, the slide presentation, which is, in fact, a PowerPoint to support today's discussion. Now have that open and ready before the program begins. We also have a variety of resources on this web page, including some organizational websites and some for follow-up study, and then the video of our site visit to Harding High School in St. Paul, Minnesota, where you can see a connected counseling program in action. We really want you to be an active part of the program today, so we have two ways now that you can connect to us. This is a radio call-in show, so we encourage you to call in your questions for our guests. Our toll-free number is 888-539-8859, and for those calling outside the U.S., the number is 864 656 4550. You may be call, begin calling in now or any time during the broadcast. We'll put you on hold for a few minutes, but we'll try to get to as many of you and your questions as we can during the broadcast. We're also, this time, accepting email questions sent to our email address, and that is ndpc at clemson.edu, and that ndpc stands for National Dropout Prevention Center. And put the word solutions in the subject line. We've got our eye on that right now, and we'll be looking for your questions. And so uh, send them whichever way is most comfortable for you. Good. Thanks, Marty. And we do look forward to your calls or your participation um, via the web. Uh, this program is for you, and you are um, a central part of it. So participate and, um, and interact uh, with the guests that we have each week. Um, as I've said, each program, this national dropout crisis didn't happen overnight, and although the bad news is there's no quick fix, there's no magic bullet to end it, the good news is that we know there are many solutions to this problem, and the solution we're focusing on today is in the area of counseling. Um, giving students the help they need, not only with academics, but in the interpersonal areas of their life that's so connected to their success in school and in life, and one of those areas they need help with is in the area of career choices and engaging them in academics through focus on the relationships of academics to careers. You know, career technology education, what we call CTE, has been on the forefront of this strategy for many years. We know that students who engage in CTE are more, not less, likely to graduate, and career counseling is a big part of that success rate. So our guest today is here to talk about a program called Connected Counseling that we are excited about. Um, Kitty Johnson joins us today from St. Paul, Minnesota, and for the past three years, Kitty has coordinated the Connecting, Connected Counseling program for the St. Paul School District and has actually been involved with the project for seven years now. As a counselor on special assignments, she helps counselors across the district learn and implement best practices to help increase student achievement for all students. Recently, um, Kitty served as our hostess uh, on a trip to St. Paul Public Schools, and we had a very interesting day visiting with students and faculty and staff of Harding High School. Uh, that's where we learned about the Connected Counseling Program and the excellent results that they were having there. 
And so we felt this would be a terrific solution to share with our listeners. So, Kitty, we're very happy to have you on the program today. Welcome. Well, thank you so much, Sam, and thank you, Marty, and Eric, and everybody over at Clemson. I do appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this and share our story with you and your listeners. And we're anxious to get to that story, Kitty. And I know you've got a lot of excellent information prepared um, for our listeners today. So, um, so let's get started. And uh, may- maybe we start with the start. Is tell us how all this got started six years ago. Sure. I'm looking at the uh, first slide on the PowerPoint and. Connected Counseling is a concept, a colleague of mine and a group of counselors were wondering how do we connect, not just with each other, but connecting with our students. And so we came up with this concept called Connected Counseling. Connected Counseling is a program that's been funded by the Bush Grant Foundation, which I'll talk about in a moment. And it's designed to excuse me, use those uh, three R's that we hear about from the Gates Foundation, the idea of introducing students to rigor, relevance, and relationship. And, of course, from a counseling point of view, we put a lot of emphasis on relationships, which is our way of reaching out to students to let them know that we want them to feel connected to the school, want them to feel connected to their futures, And we also want them to feel connected to the sense of what they do in high school is important to what they're going to be doing once they leave. So that's what Connected Counseling is. It began with the journey of counselors from around the district coming together as a team. We research best practices, and some of that is what I'd like to share with you as we move forward. So if we could go to... And Kitty, yeah. I know a lot of um, I know a lot of planning and development went into this program. It may be premature to talk about that now, but sure. um, I know you visited um, other models around the the nation. Um, right, we did have an opportunity when we first got started about seven years ago to go down to Tucson, Arizona, where Judy Bowers, Dr. Judy Bowers, was working at the time as the lead counselor in the Tucson school district. My predecessor, Dan Labore, connected with Judy, and Dan and a group of counselors went to Tucson, and we met personally with Dr. Bowers, and she introduced us to what is called the ASCA, the American School Counselors Association National Model. And Judy was instrumental as the lead counselor in Tucson to make sure that schools in grades K-12 were introducing aspects of the model. And so when we went to Tucson, we met Judy, we toured schools personally, got to interview counselors, got to interview students, and realized that this was something that was working well in Tucson, and we wanted to bring it back to St. Paul and start as soon as we could teaching our counselors about connected counseling. We've also researched other models across the country, but uh, we've really stuck with the Ask a National Model, which has really helped Um, revive our counseling program and gave us a sense of um, direction. It also helped us see where we are, and I'll talk about elements of the model as well. And I'm going to point out here um, that one of the resources we do have on the website is to that model, so uh, listeners can check that after the program. Sure. Um, Let me just share with you a little bit about our school district, some of the demographics. We are an urban district, and uh, when we first began the model, it was um, seven high schools. We have, within the last couple of years, added one other high school, which is a K-12 model. Most of our high schools here in St. Paul are grades 9 through 12. And we also invited this year our ALCs, our Alternative Learning Centers, to be on board with this project of Connected Counseling. As an urban um, district, we do have um, about 75% of our students are students of color. And we do have a balance of um, African-American is about almost a fourth of our population, Hispanic-Americans and Asian-Americans, as well as American Indian and Caucasian students. So we do have a variety of students here. We have students uh, representing over 80 different languages. So a lot of what we do with our students is um, helping them connect as well to diversity within the projects that we're working on within the schools and across the district. 
So I'd, I'd like to go to slide two and, and take a little bit of uh, time to explain to you what was our number one purpose, if you will, in coming together with the ASCA model and trying to look at solutions. Our number one solution, what we were, a number one challenge, if you will, is trying to help increase the graduation rates because we knew that we weren't doing very well there. And we wanted all students, not just students who know how to get into a counselor's office and figure out how to do their planning beyond high school. But we wanted to make sure that we were reaching out to students who didn't know how to get to the guidance office, school counselor's office, knock on the door and talk about post high school planning. So our goal was to help all students and our goal still is to help all students succeed academically and to graduate with knowledge and skills for high skilled, high wage kinds of jobs. So if we go to the next slide, we're talking about this project it is a multi-year project. There was a pre-planning year where my colleague was given some startup money to look at what do you want to do, how do you want to frame this, and it really has been a work in progress with input from counselors across the district. This is, this is really a counselor-led and counselor-driven and counselor-implemented kind of project. And I do want to take time to thank the Bush Foundation, and there's the, uh, the slide there shows their web address, and they have been very instrumental in Minnesota helping to fund this project, and they traditionally have been funding post-high school kinds of projects, junior colleges or that sort of thing. And the former uh, CEO of the Bush Foundation, Anita Pampish, said her goal was to take a look at what's happening in the high schools before students move into post high school planning to see if that would help to make a difference. So she took a big risk when she was willing to fund this project for the high schools in St. Paul. And I'm, I know that one of her goals was to help us change the culture of how we do business to make sure we reach out to all students. And I'll share with you some of our results as we move forward. But I want to thank her and also um, thank the Bush Foundation. They're the ones who helped fund did this project. On the next slide, we talk about the five goals of connected counseling and those goals, I don't want to um, go into great detail and, and read each one, but let me just uh, summarize that the counselors were invited to accept a new vision of what does it mean to be a school counselor. And that vision meant that we needed to become a part of high school reform movements. We know that most of the disciplines across the high schools, whether it's English, math, social studies, science, all have standards. We knew we needed standards and the ASCA model provided that for us. So we learned that we are part of high school reform. We are working towards increasing academic achievement. We are standards based. We have um, developed and continue to develop um, guidance curriculum and I would invite your listeners to help us um, add to our ideas and we will share our ideas with them because there's a lot of information out there that we could use to help one another. Our new initiatives is basically this connected counseling and reaching out to all students. We've invited our colleagues who are advisors, uh, teachers, administration team members to help us guide students and complete what we call our six year plan, that is four years of high school and planning two years beyond high school. We've asked all students to complete the six-year plan, and last year, class of 2008, were the first seniors that had to have a plan completed for graduation. And we're pleased to say that most of the students met that obligation. And then we also took a look at wanting to expand college access. That access is for all students and increase their, their ability to get into a college career resource center right in the school and have the opportunity to work with counselors or work with college reps and in some cases actually take um, college entrance exams right in the high school uh, college career resource centers. So those are the five major goals we've been working with these past seven, eight years. So I guess if there's any um, questions or any comments that you have on any of these goals, 
take time to answer those. Let me ask you, um, let me ask a question, and that is um, this, uh, this whole notion of changing counselor roles, how difficult was that, Kitty? It's huge. <laughs> it's still a, it's still, it's still a journey that we um, we have. You know, I, I'm a, uh, I'm a veteran counselor. I've been working uh, in public education for many years, and and I've been around where you know we hear, oh, this is another model, and it's another initiative, and you know you kind of hear one every five six years and think, well, this one will come and go, and this one will come and go, but you know this really is a change that we all need to make, not just counselors, but counselors especially, because this is our program. But it is the future. It is all of our futures to make sure that all students are engaged in developing their skills, their abilities, being strong contributors to all of our lives. Um, you know, these are the kids that are going to be, as I retire, they're going to be the ones taking care of me, and I want to make sure they have good skills. I want to make sure that this country stays vibrant, and in ways of doing that is to engage all kids as much as we can. Well, so I it's could, huge I, to yeah, change the culture. I, I couldn't agree with that more. But uh, did uh, the barriers that you confronted, did, would you say that they came more from – from the counselors or from administration who uh, had to find ways of, of filling the roles that counselors traditionally play or a combination of that? Or? You know, I think it's kind of been a combination. Um, our administration team in St. Paul is very supportive of this project um, because it got counselors out of their offices and, and into classrooms and into giving little PowerPoint presentations on – Here's a challenge that we see right now in our building about uh, students not doing well in Algebra 1. And not to pick on math people, but that was one of the projects that I worked on when mm -hmm. I was in this uh, working at Johnson High School. And we presented information and said, you know, we have too many kids that are not doing well in this particular class. So how can we as colleagues come together? and figure out solutions to help these students. And I think but we still have counselors who are struggling with this change. I'm sure. But I, I'm sure that was an important step also, and that is to um, involve them from the very beginning, even mm -hmm. particularly those who are resistant to it. Um, well, let's move on and um, and uh, take, take a, um, a deeper look, really, at what the model entails. Okay. So on the next slide, we're talking about our guiding principles. And we have three basic principles here in terms of what we're trying to accomplish. And I mentioned the idea of increasing the graduation rates for all of our student groups. Um, we wanted to connect the students to the idea of taking the most rigorous level classes that they could. Um, not that some students um, might be underestimating their ability. We wanted to challenge them to step up to maybe taking a more advanced level course in a subject area they were already doing well in and encouraging them to take a look at strengthening other areas. A lot of students, having been a former teacher myself, will say, what's the relevance of this? When am I ever going to use this? So we're trying to get um, the idea of connecting students to things that are relevant to their specific needs and interests. And most importantly, this idea of developing relationships. Uh, little story aside, when I was first working on this project, I had a group of, uh, I think it was 10 or 15 uh, ninth grade students who were not doing well in a class. I brought them together in a support group, and we met um, maybe once a week, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and had an opportunity to talk about what was getting in the way of their being successful. It's not that they didn't have the skills for some of these students. Some of these students, it was the fact that they were not living at home they had some issues that were barriers that grandmother wasn't there to wake them up in the morning. They didn't have an alarm clock, so we made sure that they had the alarm clock. Um, some of the students were talking about they had been in so many different environments within the past year that they just couldn't focus, so we invited them to have a planner. We did. We supported them as best we could with simple things that made a huge difference. The end of the period that I clicked the data on these students, their grade point average didn't bump all that fantastically high, 
And my principal said, well, you know, we, we really we want you to spend more time where you're going to be making a, a difference maybe um, with more middle-of-the-road kind of kids or whatever. And I, I said, well, you know, I understand that. So I um, tried something differently the next year. But when I was uh, – when those students became juniors in high school, I had worked with them as ninth graders, I think that they did feel a sense of connection to the school – they were still attending school. They had joined, uh, a couple of the students had joined the basketball team, and they were, they were staying engaged and productive. And uh, who's to say that that little group made a difference or not, but I think in my heart of hearts, I'd like to think it did. <laughs> I'm sure it it did. did help them stay connected and, and made them feel that there, there was somebody, one person, who really wanted to take extra time to go and say, how's it going? What's going on? And if it's not going well, not letting them skate and say, this is not okay. You can do better, and you, you know you can, and you will, and they did. Not all, but many. So relationships are very important. We also talked about this um, primary goal of ours was to redesign what school counselors do, and there's a whole bunch of information and the resources that are on the uh, on the website about the history of school counselors and we are our own worst enemies in a lot of ways we've been trying to do so much for so many for so long we kind of lost our way and within the last 10 years we have been fortunate that the American School Counselors Association Dr. Judy Bowers, Dr. Trish Hatch have come together and created what is called the National School Counselors Model and that model has really helped all school counselors across the country, across the world, really, because we're also in Japan and other countries, to really take a look at what are you bringing to the table to help increase students' academic achievement. And if you can't bring something to that table, then I think as school counselors, we really need to revisit what we're doing and add something that's going to help students increase their academic achievement. So we... Redesigned our ways of doing business. And Kitty, this might be a good time to um, break in and say that um, we have a question that was sent to us by email that relates to the Ask a National model. Um, and I think probably relates to the previous question I asked you. So this may be a rehash of what you've already said. But um, mm -hmm. the question is how should school counselors go about getting their district on board in implementing the Ask a national model, what advice would you have for those who are hitting brick walls in getting this mm -hmm. accomplished? Well, I, my, I, I really do want to encourage everybody to stick with it, and I would say start small. We actually took one challenge that we had as a group, and it was to increase graduation rates. Now, that's not a small thing to take on, but it is if you can break it down into smaller sizes. And I would say, if you could, to, to take a look. Some of our counselors work in buildings where they are the only counselor. Some of our outstate counselors are the only counselor for maybe three school districts because of declining uh, budgets. And so there's a lot of people who are out there all by themselves trying to do this work. And I would say, find an alley if you can, or somebody who's going to be your buddy, your support. Join, if possible, your school counselors organizations. Um, they, for the most part, know about this Ask a National model. And get the support if you can. Try to present something to your principal related to what's an improvement plan. All schools have them. What's one particular area your principal is saying needs improvement? And you work with your principal and your team of counselors, if you have them, or your, 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 uh, your team of uh, teachers, and you develop a goal. You develop an outcome. Um, for example, it might be our, we want to increase our graduation rates, incoming ninth graders that transition to the 10th grade by 10%. And so you develop an outcome that you find a way to, to measure, and, and you just do the best you can. But stay connected because it is – it is, a, it is a challenge to revisit or to take on something new when we're all trying to learn it at the same time. Mm -hmm. But I, I really encourage you not to go alone. If you, if you can get that support, do so. Good. Thank you. Let, let's move on through your model. Okay. The next, uh, the next slide is talking about school counselors, and we, all, we are all partners 
in the student's academic achievement, and this comes directly from Dr. Judy Bowers and um, some of the work that we did with her. We do want to challenge each other to answer questions that how are students, how are all students better as a result of receiving the services of school counseling programs. Our superintendents over the years as we've been working on this model will visit the schools and they'll talk to students about what is your six-year plan and do the students know what a six-year plan is? Do the students have an idea of what they've been learning? And as we move through um, the last four years when students knew it was going to be a part of graduation, they could at least say, yes, I know what it is and I know what I'm trying to accomplish with it. And that was sort of our little um, indicator that students were engaged with knowing what is the school counseling programs trying to help them achieve. So we want to make sure that all students have received services that are helping them engage in academic achievement and they're planning beyond high school. Well, this, uh, another question that came to us um, via email, I think relates to that and also back to the Ask a Model. But um, the question is, what role does the Ask a Model play in career and technical education programs of study? Uh, programs of study, Kitty, you know, is, um, mm -hmm. um, is a big word uh, in mm -hmm. CTE um, mm -hmm. these days. We're working with it uh, here in South Carolina and um, really nationwide through the National um, CTE Research Center on a, um, a research project we have here looking at programs of study within uh, an act in, uh, a legislative act in South Carolina. Um, but w what role does the ASCA model play in career technical education programs of study? I know you have that built into your model. Yes, we do. And, and one of our uh, three domains of the ASCA national model is the career domain, and each of those uh, three the career domain has three standards, which I um, tell you about in a little moment. But in terms of those programs of study, in St. Paul, we are connected with our uh, Perkins funding uh, person at our district level, Tracy Gower, and we have come together collaboratively as a group of counselors identifying the pathways mm -hmm. and helping to create those programs of study. It's something new for us as well, Sam, and so I can, I can let you know that we are working with Tracy in the district to begin to identify um, how can we make sure that all students in all of the subjects that they are studying in the high schools be aware of what are career clusters, mm -hmm. what are the pathways within those clusters, and within that, how can a student take a look at what are some possible job transitions from high school, our career paths, so that they know what they need to do to stay vibrant as a person looking at the world of careers. Because that is an area that is constantly changing. And I just, some of the information that I've learned over the years about careers is, is, is just staggering in that so many students, uh, adults as well, the whole world of work is changing as we speak, and so we want to make sure that kids know what is, how is the world of work organized, what's a program of study going to help them accomplish in terms of their own individual interest, abilities, and skills. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think everyone is struggling uh, with, with um, how to implement programs of study, but also uh, in, a, in agreement um, pretty much that um, it, it, uh, it needs to be implemented. and. Um, I think they're recognizing the very important role that um, that counseling really plays and will play in this. Right. Um, okay, well, sorry to interrupt, but I wanted to get those two questions in since they did deal with something you were talking about. And let's move on okay. to your model. So now we're on this slide that talks about the school counseling programs are all about the, um, developing that the leadership. We encourage our counselors, and as a matter of fact, one of our professional learning community um, sub-goals this year as counselors across the city is to continue developing leaders within the school counselors. Leaders in that we provide data and information to our principals, to our staffs, to people in the buildings to let them know how, how things are going, Where, what's the data showing, how is our graduation rates, um, how many students are passing classes, where do, we, where do we see that there might be some barriers to learning, and how can we collaborate as a team 
of, of uh, professionals within a building to help our students stay engaged in their own learning. So we are developing leadership. Um, the challenge is, is the technology and um, working in a large urban district with seven different high schools. Every high school has a different level of technological capacity to get things done on computers. And so we continue to use technology and some wanted to hold us back in the beginning saying, well, we don't have enough computers to get this done, our six-year plan, getting students engaged in completing that plan, which is an electronic portfolio. They do need a computer to do that. But the real irony is that this, this school that was having the most challenge getting things done with uh, lack of technology, when we looked at the, uh, the data, they were the school that had the most number of students participating in the six-year plan in the very beginning. So, you know, it, it's, 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 uh, technology is a, is a struggle and a challenge, but we continue to, to move forward and uh, do what we can with what we have. We all are collaborating with each other. Um, the challenge, I think, is to get parents on board, and that's been a, a challenge that I remember having uh, at Johnson. High school when I was there, we invited parents, but uh, you know the school day is sometimes done early and parents are still working and parent-teacher conferences come around maybe once a month or I was at a uh, once a quarter uh, or once a semester and we do need to figure out ways of engaging parents because they are, they are, they are our partners in all of this and we can help them as well. We talked about advocating for all students. Uh, we make data-driven decisions, meaning that if we see that there's uh, a challenge with students uh, failing courses at a midpoint time, we rally the troops and try to come up with some interventions to let these students know this is not okay. Um, students that are doing not, are not doing well on an AP exam, we might figure out a way to um, develop some study groups. We are also giving the, uh, the plan test and we look at those results, show the, uh, share those with our counselors in the building so that they can share that data with their staff. And we can look at where are students doing well and where aren't they doing well. Simple case, one student was taking a plan and didn't know what the idea omit, what, what does that mean? And didn't do well on the test because they didn't understand the concept of the word omit. And so it's simple things like that when we ga gather the data that we can say, you know, it's really very simple if we just try to engage with our students where they're coming from and we could make some very significant changes on some very, you know, easy to fix kind of um, concepts. We can teach what the word omit means. You know, Kitty, um, one of the phrases that you hear a lot today is data-driven decision-making. And you mentioned that a lot here. And I'm can you, you're, you've elaborated on a little bit, but you see it in a lot, of, a lot of areas now in education, of course. And I, I was intrigued by your mentioning of this with this model and how important that was. Mm -hmm. And uh, what are some of the things that you look at? And what is the data that you look at? And people are monitoring. It's, it's like it's coming together here with some of the things you've said. But, mm -hmm. but could you just focus on that and maybe give us a laundry list of the sorts of things that that you look at for data-driven decision-making in school counseling? Sure. Um, we, this year, and we have a uh, superintendent who has been with uh, St. Paul Public Schools for about uh, three years now. And the first thing we look at is she has a district strategic plan. And in that strategic plan, it identifies groups of students and their, what we call here in Minnesota, their MCA two scores, Minnesota Comprehensive Assessment. Minnesota has one of the worst gaps across the nation for specific populations and those achievement scores. Our, our Caucasian students and the Asian students and some groups are, are scoring very well and there are other groups that are not scoring so well in the reading, the writing and the math parts of, of those exams. So we as a group of counselors came together and we looked at our district strategic plan based on the data they have from our state department about how students are doing, uh, what element of uh, level of achievement they have in those scores. And then we took that information and said, okay, let's now take a look at individual schools 
here are your students' uh, MCA2 scores, and we can drill that down even further to say, here's a group of students who have scored in this specific range, and in that range, that, that test can be broken down into, like, do they have an idea of number sense? Do they understand vocabulary? And so we really drill down on the data to take a look at where are the strengths and then where are there some challenges. And with those challenges, we then invite the students and the teachers to focus on ways of strengthening skills. MCA 2s are strategic plan. We also take a look at um, attendance in buildings with students are beginning to fall and not coming to school. Counselors don't really work on uh, in individually with uh, improving attendance, but if a student I'm working with is not coming to school, part of my job is to make sure that I understand what's going on. Why aren't you coming? You've been absent, that's data. We can take a look at mm -hmm. and right. try to make some interventions. We are fortunate in St. Paul because we have, um, and I'm working right now in a building where we have a, a lot of data available to us via our district's um, data center. And we do invite counselors in for training on learning how to access that system and taking a look at using some of that data. But a lot of them, of course, are just saying, I'm more concerned about what's going on in my school, and we, we help take a look at what's out there in terms of grades, attendance, um, how many students are involved in extracurricular. Some kids didn't even know how to, you know, how do you, how do you get involved in extracurricular? How do you join? And that's data. So we, we, we use a lot of data to help uh, drive our decisions. And, and I think every school has, I think a lot of people think data is, you know, it's kind of like a, a four-letter word and it's foreign and it's tough. And exactly. That's we're, not, we're, not, we're not trying to, you know, be researchers and, you know, statistical deviations and all that. I mean, we're keeping it very basic, very simple. Um, what's, what's the number of students that are showing X, Y, Z things are happening? And using that information, not to say that anybody's doing a good or a bad job. Data is not about evaluating us. Data is about showing us what's happening in our buildings, with our kids, and using that information to say, you know what, if we just taught the word omit, we might have had higher scores. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And those point. relationships, too, uh, of yes. watching over these students and being aware of what are the things to be watching for is so key, I think. Yep. So we oh. use it pretty simply. We're not the researchers. Yeah, and I, th I think that's I'm, – I'm glad we <laughs> talked about that because that's yep. a word. You're right. It is a four-letter word to many of uh -huh. us. Right. Okay. Keep going um, now. Yep. So we talk about the a whole thing about systemic change, and that is making a difference in, in all buildings. And I – I do believe that I know we have made a difference in all buildings with this project. I, I just know that. And I, I, if you're asking for the data on that, it's just knowing that kids know what a six-year plan is. I can go into a building and talk to a colleague about um, how's it going with, uh, with the group of students. You've, you've developed your interventions around. You're closing the gap activities. And, you know, we're, we're, we're making a difference. We are out there doing things. And... It's evident in all of our schools. Our new schools, our ALCs, we still, we still have some work to do there, but uh, those, those kids will be getting this information and, and we'll make a change there as well. So, um, you know, having visited your school and randomly spoken with different students, they do know what's going on there with the six-year plan. They do have ideas for their future, and it, it was really refreshing to, to go there and meet the students and the counselors and the, and the principal and the teachers of, of that school. And if you're seeing that in the other schools, that's exciting. Yeah, it is. And, and they were really um, thankful for your coming by to Marty. And they, they still talk about, you know, the visit there. And, and you know, kids are kids. They want to know, well, what's the next step? When do we get to see this video? So oh, well. <laughs> they'll be excited, too. We'll, we'll make sure they see it on yeah, there. Well, um, and it's on the web, right? Exactly. Yes, right, right, yes. right. Okay. okay, so... Well, let's look at the phases now of, okay. of the grant. I think we're and, ready to move into that. Okay, and uh, on this slide, it just uh, highlights uh, the years. Uh, first phase was 03, 05. We, of course, called it beginning the course. And then we stayed the course because uh, 05, 07, we were still meeting with a lot of resistance, um, more from counselors and that learning this model and having to do one more thing was, and we were still with, um, 
you know, anything new was change, and it was hard, and I think we were, uh, my predecessor, Dan Labore, was really wise in just saying, let's baby steps along the way, let's not try to change too much too soon. And then this year, phase three, we um, aligned our efforts with our district strategic plan, and so we really are focusing on closing the gaps, as I mentioned earlier. And those closing the gaps are focusing on uh, four subgroups of the populations here in St. Paul. We want to make sure that our African-American male and female students are increasing their academic achievement. So we're working specifically across the district in all the high schools to develop interventions helpful for that group of students. We have the Hispanic males we're also working with. And we also have uh, Native American males that we're working with as well. So getting results for all students and closing achievement gaps. If you go to the next slide on phase one, begin the course, um, this talks a little bit more detail about what we did in phase one. And I just want to point out those um, six-year plan logos. Those are um, currently on the web, and the uh, web address is, um, I guess I forgot to put that in the slide, but the web address is www.sixyearplan.spps.org. Okay. And I can send that to you, too. Yeah, we can add that to the resource page, Kitty. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so that is a live link where um, we have our students click on that and they can go in and actually complete their six-year plan there. Um, we developed that in 0305 and our, our um, main goal here was to make sure that every student realized that they had a go-to place, their electronic locker, where they were asked to record information about them um, asked to record their test results, and a lot of this was indeed asking the students back in the very first version of our six-year plan to keep this information um, into their plan. We um, have since revised this, and I'll talk about that in a moment. The other important thing on this slide is that we did have the opportunity with the uh, Bush Foundation funds to bring on board what we call our guidance technicians. And this has been critically an important part of all the work all the counselors are doing across the district. A lot of counseling activities are bogged down in clerical activities, as in testing, you know, organizing the test materials, making sure everybody has a pencil. I mean, just you know, mundane things that we were asked to do. And we, we did as a team, and we had clerical support. But with the Bush Foundation, we were able to hire a person, and that person's job has really been to take that clerical load off the counselors and get into the testing and help us uh, get that work done. I tell you, anybody I have mentioned this to, especially a counselor, they, are, they turn green in front of I your know. eyes with envy. It's just such a wonderful and logical thing to do. And it's been so helpful. And it, you, you, these guidance techs just, just are thrilled to be a part of the guidance department as well and the school counseling departments across the city. I mean, we are, um, we are very blessed to have good people on board who really enjoy this work as well. So that is phase one of our, of our grant, begin the course. Okay, and let's, let's move on to um, what happened next. Okay, staying the course, phase two, 0507. We have monthly meetings. A group of counselors across the district come, and sometimes we go to each other's schools so that we can see what uh, the other school counseling uh, departments look like, what's your uh, career college resource center looking like. But we do meet monthly, and our monthly meetings are times for us to come together and give support, take a look at data, take a look at interventions that are working or maybe needing to be tweaked uh, across. Uh, it works well at one school, but might not work so well at another. And just be there to support one another and to keep people engaged in this whole thing of connected counseling. Now, now for these monthly meetings, do, do you have a planned agenda each time, or do people just come and share what's been going on? And, and I'm really curious about what happens there. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a combination of both, Marty. Um, I have an agenda that, you know, I send out ahead of time and, and tell people, for example, our meeting this Thursday 
We're going to spend one hour looking at our new program for the six-year plan called Naviance. And as a team of counselors across the city, we're just going to take a look at the ninth grade. And um, there's a place where ninth graders would log into the program, and we're going to take a look at what's the welcome page look like for the ninth graders across the city. Mm -hmm. Not to say anything has to be all the same, but let's just show each other what the other schools are doing. And we kind of share ideas and support one another. That looks good for you, but it wouldn't work. Uh, well for our school. And and then the other hour is to talk about um, what are some of the frustrations. You know, kind of a, I'm really solution focused. I really try to get these meetings to say we all have challenges and we can all share those challenges, but we also need to move forward with solutions. And so some of the times it becomes more of a I just have so many challenges, I need to share those right now, and I, I try to have some structure around a two-hour meeting. But my goal is that everybody comes there with a solution or leaves with a solution to a challenge they presented. Easier well, said than done. Well, we like that word, goal. don't we, Sam? We like that, we like, we like that word, solutions. That, that, got, that got us up on our seats. You stole that from us. Hey. I did. I did. Yeah. I tell you. Yeah. Well, we, hope, we hope a lot of people will steal that. <laughs> I know. Exactly. So, That's what it's, it's all so about. It's critically yeah. important. Yep. yep. And the last phase of our grant, phase three, was getting results, and that's the phase that we are currently in. Last year, as I mentioned, the six-year plan became a graduation requirement for seniors, and um, that was uh, a journey that some of them didn't think was going to happen, but it did, and they got it done, and it was a matter of making sure that they had their – uh, college applications, if indeed they were going on to college or into the world of work, they had identified two years, what they were going to be doing two years beyond high school, and not just identified it, but had completing a step or two in that direction. If it was the world of work, then we wanted to make sure that they had completed a job application. If they were going into the military, we wanted to make sure that they had connected with the people they needed to connect to make sure that was going to happen. If it was the idea of a two-year technical, we wanted to make sure they had that connection. Some of my students would come in and talk about wanting to be um, a beautician. One of my seniors, when I was over at Johnson, said, I want to be a beautician. We took a look through the Internet of different uh, cosmetology schools around. We looked at proprietary, those that are fee-based and private. And then we compared that to those that are public and 18-month, certificate kind of a program so that they know what's out there in terms of what can you do with this particular interest and this student wanted to learn how to be a cosmetologist so that she would have a skill to help her when she goes on to her she wanted to be um, I think it was something to do with social work and she was going to go on to college but first her first step was um, cosmetology and we show I showed her all I just showed her the programs here's one school's um, tuition fee here's another and here's a third you here's the data you make the decision and you know she she kind of I think had oh wow that's interesting when you look at one school is charging 20,000 and the other school is charging 3,000 hmm, it's nice. it's it's up to the students to decide but she may not have known that there were differences without maybe taking a look at the data that's out there on the Internet. Kitty, um, let me ask this question before you go on to talk about um, the difference this program has made in the lives of students. Uh, you mentioned earlier the need to um, involve parents, um, different ways um, of, of involving parents more. And I wondered, since this six-year plan is now um, – mandated as a graduation requirement. Um, are parents required to sign off on these plans? And if not, um, what involvement um, do they have in, in helping, um, helping their children shape these plans? Right. We don't have a, uh, at this moment in time and up, up to this moment in time, we have not had uh, rec uh, input from parents that they had to sign off on the plan. But I, I do believe we need to we need to revisit that decision. Um, parents can view their students' six-year plan 
if the students give them permission to use their um, username passwords because it's all um, secure information. But I, I think what we need to do in terms of getting parents involved is have the parents even come maybe to the career resource centers and, and have them take a look at what their students are doing. I do believe in this, is this economy, we're working with first generation college uh, going students. We're working with uh, a lot of people who as adults and parents might be in a transition themselves. And they could probably use some of these resources. Mm -hmm. Because I remember some of the parent teacher conferences that I was at at Johnson High School. We would put out some booklets, which we call our Minnesota Careers, which is uh, a hard copy, if you will, of what's involved in completing a six year plan. And I think a lot of parents took it, and not only for their sons and daughters to take a look at, but they themselves said, you know, this is something that I wish. I would have had and that I might even need and I know a friend of somebody who could actually use this information for their own plan, their own career development. So it's a real challenge, Sam, and, and I, you know, I, I wish we had the answer. We have extended days to help bring parents on board, but I think by requiring parents to come in and to at least have one meeting with a counselor or a group of teachers to say, Here's your son, your daughter's um, plan that they have put together. What do you think of it? And we want to make sure that you're aware of this as well. Um, but that's been a that's a challenge. We'll continue to. Well, to, it, uh, it, I can it. tell you that it is certainly no guarantee uh, for getting parents in and involved because that is a requirement um, of the individual graduation plans in South Carolina under this new act that I spoke about earlier and. Mm -hmm. Um, they're having a lot of difficulty uh, getting parents to come in and sign off. I think there's a provision that if the parent doesn't come in after three attempts, then um, then the school can sign off on the plan. And, and uh, just I, I, I shouldn't even repeat this because we've not fully done this study, but just in a cursory look, you know, roughly a third of the parents are signing. In some schools, of course, that would be much higher. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, I think everybody is working and it's, it's just a matter of maybe on a Saturday or, you know, I think we have to, we talk about thinking outside the box and I somewhat hate that uh, phrase, but I do believe we have to do things a little differently. We do have what we call a Think College Early Fair and we try to find um, parents where they are, but uh, I think we're still, that's, that's still a challenge and it is a requirement for high school graduation, and we are working more and more towards getting parents involved as best we can. Well, um, let's focus on, uh, yeah, let's take a look at the students and what's happened as a result of the program. Okay. Um, the, uh, the last thing here I want to share, uh, well, this next slide is talking about the, how students are different as a result of the school counseling program. And this particular uh, picture came from a uh, PowerPoint presentation that Dr. Bowers presented, and I, and I like the image in that um, the wall represents to me the metaphor for the barriers that a lot of students have in their own learning, whether it's whatever it might be, um, academics, it could be personal social, there's just so many things that are going on with students in their lives right now that makes it difficult for them to do well academically in school. And they all come with different size of the ladders. And some have some skills that um, just being, um, have more opportunities just by nature of the fact of their environment, their families, their whatever. And others have shorter ladders. But our jobs as counselors is to help them all achieve what they want to achieve once they graduate from high school. We take a look at some of the results from what we call our carry they were the external evaluators for our program. They were a group of uh, people, researchers from the um, University of Minnesota, the Center for Applied Research and Educational Improvement. And they actually collected data for us for the last seven years. And we have uh, opportunity to put things together in a uh, book. And this particular report that I'm looking at is the December 06 report. We have new evaluators that are on board now for the 07, 09, and we'll be adding our results from their information as well. Um, some of our uh, goal number one was improved uh, performance for increased school completion. 
and during the second phase of the grant, our graduation rate increased by 2.6 percent. It's still not very high, but it's, it's gone up from 63.3 uh, percent in 05 to 65.9 percent in 06, and it increased 8.5 percent in four years while we were doing this grant. So our increase of graduation rates, which was one of our major goals, has happened um, within the first six years of the grant. Remains to be seen what comes in in 07, 09, but I'm confident those rates will increase, uh, continue that increased rate. Um, the high quality connection with adults, this whole thing about relationships, um, that has been consistently going up across uh, the district, an increase of 8.1% uh, in um, 05 to 3.9% 8, in 06. We, we talk about number of students taking uh, college prep classes, increasing the rigor. Um, we have an increase in there as well, 44% in 0405, number of uh, students taking honors classes. That's been one of our areas where we are seeing a decline within the past few years, and so we want to take a look at why students aren't taking more of these academically rigorous courses. Um, the six-year plan completion, that's something that we talked about as a high school graduation, and that's continuing to go up as well. I personally believe if you look at the data, that gives you the numbers, but I also believe that if you're looking at the sense of that personal social um, re relationship, that I do believe every student coming into our schools in St. Paul is feeling that they are connected with one adult, whether it's a a counselor, a teacher, or somebody who knows about them and who knows their academic plans and is making sure that they are on track to not only graduate but to also transition into the world of work with a solid awareness of what they need to succeed before they actually graduate. Now, Katie, you have a website here um, for the CARI team. Uh, yeah. That is something that has that report on it. Is that yes, what it there does. Is? Yes, it does. Yep. Thank okay. you. It does. Okay. Yep. We, we just got an email question, actually. Okay. So um, if that's okay, I'll just sure. give that to you now. Um, uh, this call, uh, this emailer wants to know, what's the best way for parents to effectively communicate with a school counselor um, in respecting busy schedules of counselors and parents? Is it email, personal visits, phone calls, or, you know, what are you finding? Well, I think now emails are most important for us, but a phone call. We answer all of the requests for help and wanting to connect, but for me personally, and I think for the most counselors, it is an email. And, and going the other way, what are you finding most effective for reaching parents? Is it dependent on many things, I suppose? Well, you know, it is, and, and um, because um, of technology, I know we have what we call our student portal, we have a parent portal, so again, the technology emails, most parents, when I was at Johnson, would say, here's my email address, keep me posted, um, uh, I think email both ways. Okay. Phone calls are good too, cell phones, um, you know, in this day of technology, I, there's so many ways, but it's, it's what works for um, the particular family and parent. Yeah, at some so. point here, I know we're about to get into concluding comments as the hour's almost over. Oh, my but goodness. I know, but we've been talking a lot. But one, one of the things that, that we um, you know, talked about when we spoke with you yesterday was the groundwork that you all have done up there in St. Paul for developing a program because people listening to this are going to think, well, that sounds wonderful. But look, it took them six years <laughs> to get there. Tell us um, uh, how much of this is something that, had, you know, the work that you've done is something we can build on or just, just, you know, that particular conversation we were having on that topic? Well, you know, it is, it has been a work in progress for six years and um, our funding for this grant is over at the end of this year. And so we have been encouraged by our funders to look at systemic change. What is it that you're going to do the same now that you've had the opportunity for this grant to, to do all of these things? And and I think as a grassroots effort, I mean, I think this whole thing of school reform, especially with, with standards-based, we all as counselors want to make sure that we're, we're not doing random acts of counseling. It's not about how good we feel about what we do, but making sure that what we do is in a very strategic, a very thoughtful, planned way of saying we want to reach all students. And I think everybody can do that, whether you have a grant or not. You can take a look at 
how are your practices helping increase student achievement? You know, having been a teacher, I can say what's my teaching, but more importantly, what are kids learning? And I think we, we all can do that. And I, I think just being able to identify one thing you want to change, get support, learn the ASCA model. There are people out there who are willing to help you. Yeah. Well, it's always nice not to have to totally reinvent the wheel. And so I think what's gone on up there has been is really helpful. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I think I, I agree. I think that the modeling that you've done, the planning and development that you've put in this would certainly shorten the time it might take another school or district to implement this program. And I think that would be an important point for anyone considering this. Let me ask you, uh, Kitty, also, we, we talked about this in a previous conversation, but um, the question hasn't come up with our listeners. So let, let me ask if um, in planning for the future um, you're looking to – um, drive this program down to the middle grade so that maybe instead of a six-year plan, you've got a seven-year plan or an eight-year plan. That's correct, right. And just as we speak, this morning I had a conversation with some colleagues in the, uh, in the junior highs, and we are indeed going to be taking a look at having students in the seventh and eighth grade. Uh, here in St. Paul, it's mostly junior high. There's some middle schools, five, six, seven, and eight, but uh, junior highs, and having them begin to identify what are your interests, what are your abilities, what are your skills, and we are going to um, invite our uh, Naviance team to help develop this six-year or eight-year plan in the junior highs, not duplicating efforts and making sure that it's developmentally appropriate, because having been a junior high teacher, I know a 14-year-old is going to say, what am I going to do in my life? Well, you know, I'm going to play basketball or whatever. And we want to make sure it's developmentally appropriate. So do they know how to be organized? Do they know how to study? Do they know how to plan just the simple things, again, to help them record in their Naviance uh, electronic portfolio what they want to do and build on that as we go through junior high, high school, and then beyond high school? Well, we have uh, we've gone a little over the hour, and that's good because the, the discussion was um, terrific. This has been a, a great overview, Kitty. I know that there are many more um, many more details, and we invite our listeners to consult the web page uh, for resources there and to email or contact you directly for any other information that they want. There there is a lot to this solution of connected counseling. Um, we hope our listeners have found today's program and the resources provided a good starting point, um, really for their own exploration into this emerging model. All right, Sam. And, and we want to remind our listeners that this is a radio webcast, and like all our monthly programs, it will be archived on our website, so you can go back and listen. Again, recommend that your friends and colleagues listen. And you can even use that archive program for a professional development activity for an entire faculty or community group. So I want to thank our guests for this month, Kitty Johnson. Kitty, uh, you've given us uh, plenty of information and resources to get, get us started in this important area. Um, I believe that this model and others like it focus on engaging students and involving them in decisions about their education. And we know that students who drop out are not engaged with school, so these solutions work. So I think it's now up to each of us to explore further what you've presented to us, and uh, that we all begin to apply these solutions to our work to help more students graduate. Hey, Kitty, I wanted to add my th uh, thanks to Sam. Uh, we're so pleased that you could join us today. Well, thank you. It's been an honor and a privilege. Thank you so much. These radio webcasts will be broadcast monthly on the fourth Tuesday of each month. Check the webpage for the exact dates and content of each broadcast. Our next program is set for October. And we are going to be featuring Christy Challenger of Pasco, Washington, who will share information about their teen parent program. And then in November, we have Dr. Terry Greer, who will be talking about the Middle College High Schools in Guilford County, North Carolina. So there's much to look forward to this fall. We just ask you to stay tuned to our website. This current webcast will be available to listen to again on uh, www.dropoutprevention.org within the next two hours. And it's downloadable for your iPod or MP3 players. 
It's also available on iTunes, so you can subscribe to Solutions like I do and get each month's program to hear again. So thanks to all of you for listening and participating. Remember, we know why students are dropping out of school, and with research-based solutions, we can assure that all our students graduate. Join us next month for more Solutions to the Dropout Crisis. 